Welcome to episode seven of the Restorers podcast. We're really excited that you've joined us today. Um, we're going to be talking about a critical issue. Obviously, you know Water Street um, because probably <laughs> most of all because we work with people experiencing homelessness. And when you think of homelessness, you think of housing and, and the challenges we face in our community and across the country, especially nowadays uh, with affordable housing and being able to sustain and maintain housing in, in the economic environment we're in. So today, that's what we're going to be focusing on, and I'm really excited that we're starting off our conversation with Mike McKenna, who is the CEO of Tenfold. Thanks for joining us, Mike. It's good to be here. Thanks, yeah. Jack. And I want to give you a chance to explain Tenfold. Many of you may know Tenfold, but you may know Tenfold in its previous iteration. So Mike, tell us you've had a recent merger and a new name change, and tell we us about have. that. We have. It's uh, been a, a big couple of years. Um, Leaving aside the pandemic, we've also been doing this merger, and that's between two organizations that served Lancaster County for a long time, Tabor Community Services, which has been around since the late 60s, and then LHOP, Lancaster Housing Opportunity Partnership, been around since the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. And when we were both going through strategic planning, we sort of looked up and down the street from each other. Our main offices at the time were on King Street, and we said, could we be doing more together? Mm -hmm. You know, recognizing that the affordable housing challenge in our community is so significant having the ability to work as one united team and offer a bigger continuum of services truly from people who are unsheltered living on the streets, people who are in shelter with our program TLC, up through people who are in a rental environment and are trying to find stability and success in that environment, up through folks who say, I wanna be a homeowner and we'll help them on that journey too. And then we also have a lending arm that's doing some uh, lending to developers to create more affordable mm -hmm. housing as well as doing closing costs and, and down payment assistance loans for individuals trying to get into their first home. So yeah. this entity that was Tabor and LHOP coming together, we felt like it really deserved uh, a new name that honored the past, but also charted the future for us. And so that's where Tenfold emerged. Right. And uh, we've been Tenfold since about um, May of, of 2021 and mm -hmm. um, really feel like we're leaning into that. Um, and that's a, a promise we're making to the people that we serve that we're going to hope for them and try to deliver alongside them, you know, greater mm -hmm. success in the future. It's for people who invest in the work. Uh, it's for yeah. our, our team and our collective goal around impact um, and really wanting to see that we are greater than the sum of our parts. And it's also about our partnerships, right? Yeah. We work closely with Water Street. We work closely Absolutely. with so many other organizations. It's how do we do this work in such a way that it lifts all of these right. goals that we have for the community. That's one of the things I love about working in Lancaster uh, in this arena is there is such a spirit of collaboration and support. None of us can do it alone. Right. Uh, even before we got on just now, I was saying, like, Tabor does something, like, you're touching it all the way from mm -hmm. unsheltered homelessness to people buying their own homes and even creating affordable housing. Like, that's just phenomenal, that combination of LHOP and Tabor to now be tenfold and having that kind of impact. And continuing to collaborate and partner with others Absolutely. in the community. So, and, we can get uh, so much more done together. I have to give a know? personal shout out to how Tenfold helped me 26 years ago when I was buying my first house in Lancaster. I took the first time home buyers class and got some closing cost assistance. Um, so I can attest personally to the impact they've had on my life, uh, my journey in Lancaster. And, and I wonderful. know you guys have impacted I'm, I'm an of alum of the home buyer class as well. Learned a lot, as I shared with you. There were some things yeah. while I was sitting in the class I realized <laughs> I would have done differently if I had taken the class a little bit earlier. So yeah. anybody who's listening, if you're contemplating, <laughs> find out where you can get home buyer education yeah. before you go on that journey because it really will help. Yeah. And you and your organization have a unique view of the challenges we're facing. So to get to our topic of, of mm -hmm. sustainable housing and the role that plays in helping people avoid homelessness, get out of homelessness, um, we have a unique challenge in our community and country right now. Tell us a little bit about what we're facing uh, in that arena. Yeah, so we're seeing that the supply of housing, pretty much for any income level, but especially as you look to households that are low income or very low income, there's a big mismatch mm -hmm. between the number of households looking for those units that are considered affordable and the actual supply of those units. Right. And so what we see in that environment is that some landlords have this incentive to charge a maximum rate that they can without also investing in that property right. because they know that there's a lot of people seeking that housing. And then we also have an incentive on the different end of the market 
where most of the new construction is actually single family developments, right. which are priced to sell at a price point that's quite high, typically 300, 400 or 500 thousand yeah. dollars. And we know that the actual incomes for so many of the people that Water Street serves or that tenfold serves would be significantly less. You know yeah. these would be households making sometimes less than thirty thousand right. dollars a year trying to make ends meet and seeing that they're spending, more than 30% of their income. That's sort of the national standard is 30% of your income or less is considered housing affordability. Over that, you're considered cost burdened. And we have families that are spending 60% of their income, 70% of their income. And what happens in that scenario, when you have to spend that much on the rent or that much on the mortgage, what's left for medical bills? What's right. left for education? What's left for things that are important to the well-being of the family, yeah. right? So and when those momentary crises come up that you can't even plan for, let alone the mm -hmm. regular costs. Exactly. Where's that now, reserve? Now Most likely vulnerable. it's not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we see it not only, I mean, not only in the for sale, you mentioned some of the numbers around the for sale market and, and how high that is, but even the influx right now in Lancaster City, there are a number of apartment projects mm -hmm. that are in the Indeed. works. You know, they're either in planning and approval phase, some under construction, some just completed construction. I mean, literally well over a thousand units being built mm -hmm. right now in Lancaster, but the vast majority of them are market rate and luxury. Yes, I think the statistic I've seen for the city of Lancaster is about 15% of those units would be considered affordable, yeah. which is itself significant. And we're celebrating and there's Absolutely. been a lot of uh, time and attention spent into finding the financing to make those deals work for that number of units. But as you said, most of that new supply is going to a higher end of the market. So it won't have that relief effect yeah. that all of us who are trying to work with people on their journey out of homelessness or people who are already in an apartment, but perhaps need to find something that's more affordable or closer to work, or maybe something that um, gives them uh, the opportunity to live in the neighborhood of their own choosing, you know, those options mm. are fewer and farther yeah. between. Yeah, and it's one thing for, you know, a family that is making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year to not be able to have the exact choice they want, um, and maybe going to a community that wouldn't be their first option because they're priced out. But then when you get down to you know thirty, forty, forty-five thousand, but you, if you've got a family, um, now you're looking right. at how do I get my family with three children into a two bedroom apartment or a one bedroom apartment and we're putting beds in the living room and right. we're sleeping on the floor and and we just saw game. you know these tragic stories in Philadelphia and New York mm -hmm. City where uh, multiple families were doubled up and there were these terrible fires and, and a significant loss yeah. of life and I think you know a lot of people react to the the safety element and we're saying well why why would they do that and not recognizing well there's systemic issues that lead multiple families to have to live in the same yeah. unit where you do find a scenario where maybe 16 people are living in a townhome. Right. It wouldn't be the optimal choice, right? But it's a, it's a reflection of the economic yeah. uh, struggles that those households were facing. Right, right. And there's a degree to which it's, you know, do I double up, triple up, or do I go to the street or to a shelter mm -hmm. and, uh, and trying to make those choices? That's, and that's a really, maybe that's a topic for another day sure. <laughs> um, that we could look into. It's a kind of a hidden aspect of homelessness, this doubling up and tripling up. That, right. You know, HUD definitions don't even recognize that as being homeless. Um, and, True. and what I love in our community is that, like Lanco, my home, our, our coalition, partnering with the school districts, because school districts recognize that as mm -hmm homelessness and all the challenges that come with that when you're doubled up and how do we bring our resources and partnerships together to help right. families in those situations even if the HUD dollars don't follow mm -hmm. right but it's still part of the picture and it's still the experience of those families absolutely and so we need to be able to respond to that yeah and and we know there's another issue that's that's kind of a contributing factor in the environment we're in right now, we came through the pandemic and we had this eviction moratorium, which was incredibly helpful in the moment. Right. Um, but that eviction moratorium has expired. And I'm curious to hear, what are we seeing locally uh, related to that? Yeah. So the eviction moratorium was the, the right call um, in light of the public health risks and in light of the economic fallout. We knew there were so many, you know, millions of Americans who lost yeah. income in those months of the pandemic early on and then that made it that much harder for people to stay in their homes but as we know having to serve people in a congregant setting or in other yeah. types of of homeless settings can be really challenging when you're trying to maintain uh mitigation for covid 
So the, the moratorium definitely worked. What it created, though, was a pretty significant distortion in what happens with the natural turnover in the rental market. Yeah. So we're seeing now um, record numbers of referrals you know, per month to the coordinated entry system for homelessness. A lot of times the reason in Lancaster County why people are facing homelessness was a major household disruption and sometimes eviction yeah. uh, one is one of those big disruptions. So we're now seeing all of these households who've lost their housing. We're also seeing record numbers of people applying for eviction prevention assistance. Right. So we're very fortunate. We have the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. That's a nationwide program uh, and administered locally through our county housing authority in partnership with about 20 organizations providing yeah, application assistance. You guys assistance. are playing a big role in that, I know. We have been processing yeah. uh, the eligibility side for tenants um, for a long time now, and we have over 6,000 households that have applied for that. Wow. And about half of them have already received the assistance, which is great news. Obviously, though, there's still a big delta yeah. there. We need to be able to close that gap. Um, and then there's households who weren't even aware that that program existed, right? Despite right. a lot of efforts right. to communicate about the program, there's households who didn't know. Yeah. And they, they did get evicted. Yep. And so now they're trying to rebuild, but they're trying to rebuild in an environment where the rental market is even tighter than it would be in a normal year, which as we know, you know, in 2019, it's not yeah. like the housing search was easy um, or the costs associated with moving right. into housing and staying in housing were easy. So that's really a challenge. Um, to a degree, I suppose, an unintended consequence of a, of a smart policy decision at the time. And I think what it points to is we need to maintain an eviction prevention safety net. Mm. So we have the ERAP program that was created through the federal legislation, but the funding for that will sunset later yeah. this year. September 20 of 22 is when okay. the last applications can be received. The final payments will be made in December. But we know pre-pandemic we still needed eviction right. support and we have the eviction prevention network locally that network will continue to exist yeah the key challenge for us will be can finding we, the resources the on the funding, same scale can we get the resources yeah. and then we also have folks who maybe have received the assistance but there is a period at which the assistance times out you reach the maximum right. benefit level but right. they're still struggling for a lot of different reasons as i'm sure you've talked about on this <laughs> podcast right everybody's story is a little bit different Absolutely. there's some big patterns there but um uh, and oftentimes it has to do with what's happening in in the job market. And sometimes that's comfort levels with returning to the office. Sometimes it's child care constraints. And also I think people sort of collectively demanding, you know, different wages, right? So that this yeah. grind that they're in is not going to be maintained. But that means there's still a real pinch when it comes to making the rent payments. Um, and so that's going to be one of these ongoing ripple effects that we yeah. see. Like the moratorium has ended. The funding will one day sunset, but the struggles will continue yeah, beyond that, and we change. need to have a plan. Yeah, yeah, we may see some ups and downs because of specific circumstances like the pandemic, but those those things still exist. Right. And we know all those contributing factors, especially the disruption in the household. Mm -hmm. It's job loss. It's divorce. It's you know major health, health care. incidents. Mm -hmm. Those things continue to happen, whether there's a pandemic or not. Right. So uh, I'm glad you highlighted that as one of the challenges we're facing. I think the other piece of it, too, then we think about that's a lot of what can drive towards homelessness or towards instability in right. housing. We and you work with a lot of people who have they've been homeless. They've been on the street. They've been right. in shelter. They've walked through some programs, possibly, or they've, they've found a job and they're, they're trying. What's it look like right now? You know, and we've touched on this a little bit, but but just from a number standpoint, if you can help us understand, you know, what's the average apartment cost in Lancaster and, and what would that demand? Like, just so we have some real numbers, because, again, many of our listeners, maybe they haven't. It's been years since they were renting right. an apartment on their own. And, and, you know, my first apartment was three hundred and twenty bucks over mm -hmm. on Lemon Street. Um, that would be a, a dream. <laughs> that was <laughs> amazing. And it, yeah. and it was it was a one bedroom, but it had this huge oversized living room that I actually had a roommate for a while. And at three twenty a month. Wow. Fantastic. And I'm not right. that old. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. But what what are we facing today for like a two bedroom yeah. apartment and some of those? So challenges? the the average two bedroom would run around thirteen hundred. Um, and to be able to afford that, that means you need to have a job that's about twenty five dollars an hour. But you compare to where HUD would designate. So HUD sets, you know, market standards for market all of yeah. the markets across the country. 
in Lancaster, they would say it's a little under 1100 for yeah. that fair market rent. So you already have a gap of, of 200. Um, and then even when you're looking at, at that amount, you still see households that are making significantly less. So you need Absolutely. to be in the $19 an hour to be able to maintain Absolutely. that fair market rent apartment. But we know that the median renter wage uh, from some research that the National Low Income Housing Coalition did is closer to $15 an yeah. hour, which itself is progress, right? That is moving in the right direction, but it's still not enough right, if you're right, a household right. with a single earner to be able to only spend that 30% yeah. of your rent and be able to have the resources for all the other costs of living. So I think, you know, one of our reactions in this moment is like, there's so many job opportunities right now. True. Right? And we know that. We have some openings by the way. Um, <laughs> As do we. <laughs> um, and, and wages are going up, right? So right. it's really exciting that you're like, wow, I can make $17 an hour doing something I used to make 12 Yeah, I don't want to discount that progress. It's great progress, but the reality, to afford a two-bedroom apartment, you need to make 25 an hour. And there aren't $25 an hour jobs right. just jumping out for people right now. And so I know we're walking through that challenge with our guests. We'll be talking actually with one of our case managers in a little bit about some of those specific challenges and, and, and what we've run into. You know, you land a good job, you feel like you're making progress, and then you look up and you right. can't find an apartment anywhere near your price range. Right. And you run the risk at the same time of losing some other government benefits that could change, you know, how your whole household budget yeah. fits together. Yeah. And what happens when, so again, what's the option then? So these, the $1,300 average rent for a two bedroom, what do, what do people end up doing uh, who don't want to be on the street, don't want to be in a shelter, and they're looking for a place to stay? What kinds of places do they end up finding? Right, right. So we do see that there's uh, scenarios where if it's multiple earners in the household, that absolutely makes the, the benefits mm -hmm. work better. Sometimes that's you know, a couple that's married, or sometimes it's unrelated individuals who have, yeah. have decided to, to live together. Um, there's uh, a supply that's limited but important of what we call accessory dwelling units. So okay. that would be um, perhaps it's a, a townhome uh, that had a garage attached to it, and the garage was converted to an apartment or something okay. like that, or commonly called like an in-law suite. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is something that can um, increase the supply meaningfully, the difference uh, really depends on what municipality you live in. Some mm -hmm. municipalities allow it by right to create that. Other municipalities say, don't even ask. Yeah, so yeah. that creates some uncertainty for the homeowner. But what's what would be beneficial in that case is you have two positive outcomes. Let's say it's a, a senior who owns their home but is struggling to keep up with taxes, for example. Right. And then you have someone who's struggling to find housing. Now you have a housing unit that's earning income for that senior and it was creating, you yeah. know, a, a unit that somebody could afford. Uh, there is also a limited supply of boarding houses. Some of those would be very reputable and run with uh, good intentions in mind. And that's an optimal scenario, right? Because renting yeah. a room is, of course, going to be more affordable than renting an apartment or a house. Uh, then there's some that are illegal. And that's where right. we get concerned about uh, property violations, the, yeah, safety, the safety, the condition issues, of that property where we would yeah. say, oof. That is not a good outcome. Yeah. But there certainly are some times where a boarding house can be a great solution and actually very well run. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, we see that, especially with some of our guests who, again, they're coming out. This is their first experience back in the housing market um, and trying to find the right ones. But I can't tell you how many times we've also walked along to do a to do a home visit with somebody who's like, yeah, I found a room. It's going to be great. And we go in there and just the flags go, go off everywhere. all everywhere mm -hmm. of how unsafe it is, how unsustainable it is. And... Um, I but it is exciting to hear about like the co-housing mm -hmm. uh, options, the auxiliary units, and and the creative solutions that are mm -hmm. generating in our community. And there's there's a network of landlords who um, have multiple motives, right? There's certainly a desire to make some income, but sure. they know about the challenges in housing. Tenfold has worked with an incredible network of landlords for decades. I'm sure that Water Street has many of those mm -hmm. same relationships as well. And so they are charging rents that would be more affordable, that would be in that fair market rent or right. even less. And so yeah. that connection and relationship that our case managers, housing locators have with that those landlords can make a big difference because that can be, you know, now we have this opportunity. Yeah. And yeah. then we do have some really um, – 
significant players in the affordable housing Yeah, I was going to uh, ask market. about that because so, obviously here in Lancaster, I think we're blessed. We have two great uh, affordable housing developers right here in the community, yes. others who are interested in the community. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, HDC, Mid-Atlantic, Community Basics would be two uh, large developers of affordable housing. So they would create, uh, most of the time, communities where all of the units are designated as affordable, right. um, and they maintain that affordability over the long term. It's usually a minimum 15 to 20 years, but both organizations yeah. very committed to sustaining yeah. it even beyond that. There is an... Uh, Frequent turnover in some of those communities, but it does happen as well, and those yeah. are another key connections. And, and they likewise have stated commitments to serving people with housing yeah. barriers, including individuals with a history of homelessness. Yeah, and it's awesome that we have that resource in our community, and, and they're continuing to develop. I know they both have developments a lot of under, under works way, right yeah. now, um, and so that's going to add to our numbers. And but but there is that challenge, the waiting lists. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. HDC, for example, I, I went on theirs. All of their Lancaster, other than their senior ones, have or closed their waiting list mm -hmm. right now because they, they have so many names on it, so they've got to hold off for a while. CBI has, hasn't has run into that yet, but I know they have long waiting mm -hmm. lists for a lot of their, their properties. We're, we're blessed by the work they do. Um, we need more, though. And I, I guess Absolutely that would be my more. last question to you, um, thinking about, like, what does the future hold? Um, where do we see some hope? We talked about some of the creative solutions already. But where else from a from an affo bringing more affordable housing to the table? Yeah, I think a real potential is for uh, having conversations with market rate developers and talking about the financing to include a percentage of new units that they're bringing online as designated as affordable. Yeah. And there are a lot of creative financing tools out there. It could be a mix of grants. It could be a mix of lower interest loans. Uh, the origin of the investments for that could come from a lot of different places, from government, from financial institutions, from nonprofits. Um, but saying, hey, 10 percent, 10 percent, not an enormous amount. Yeah. That if can you're still doing a hundred work. unit community, can you do 10 of those at, at affordable rates? Exactly. Yeah. And so there's a, uh, a lot of uh, exciting conversations starting in that space. Of course, we want more of the, you know, developments where it, it's the affordable housing yeah. for for everyone. And those should be located all over the county. Those should not yeah. be restricted just to certain right. places. But it can also be a private developer who's maybe uh, rehabbing just a few homes or somebody who's doing a large scale 100, 200 yeah. units and wants to designate a, a piece of that. Yeah. And in addition to the financing, we need to look at the the zoning regulations, look at the zoning standards. Yeah, where is There's that restricted? Lot. And how can we change that to to make exactly. it more inviting. It doesn't sound Absolutely. very exciting, but so many decisions do get made at that local township level. Uh, and there's a lot of difference in how those are set up. And all of those differences for a developer to try to keep <laughs> up with those, that costs money, that costs time, that costs yeah. expertise. Yeah. And that's part of what contributes to making the creation of more affordable housing yeah. uh, more expensive and more difficult. So, so we need to look at the financing, look at the policies. And then there's the PR element, right? Because we do Absolutely. have this not in my backyard sentiment in various parts of the community. And I think people understanding that having housing choice and people of all income levels yeah. being able to live where they choose and be part of neighborhoods, be part of community, that's a blessing for yeah. all of us. That's Absolutely. not a hardship, that's a blessing. Yeah. And it enhances the community like as a whole. And I think that's that's a Absolutely. much broader conversation we can have. Another Maybe I'll bring you back. I would love it. And we could talk <laughs> about that dynamic yeah, of, of being the a value good neighbor, of having right? those mixed communities, mixed income levels. We used to have that all over, and mm -hmm. it, it's, that was the it, norm. it's gone. Um, but the value of bringing that back. Um, and. and you know, I'm hearing you talk about the challenges, the regular, the differences in municipalities, and the challenges in cost of development. Um, I have a good friend who who runs the mission uh, in Los Angeles, right on Skid Row, and you know they've dedicated a billion dollars to creating affordable housing wow. for the homeless, um, but it's costing them six hundred thousand dollars per unit. Oh my gosh! Because of all the regulatory things, all of the demand, and and the cost of property and, mm -hmm. and building in LA. Right. I'm grateful we're in Lancaster. Yeah. Right. And and they're working on those <laughs> <Our> costs <laughs> are not on that it's scale. Not, Thankful not for anywhere that. near there, but it's unbelievable. And you, so they put a billion dollars towards it, and they've only created like 500 it, it units. It doesn't go nearly and, as far. And as they have think. tens of thousands of people on the street. It's a whole different scenario than ours. Um, but it's it's. Uh, 
endemic across the country. Mm -hmm. um, Lancaster, we have our own unique challenges, but it's all over. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about the individuals who are impacted. And um, so we're going to be spending the second half of our conversation with with Wilsa Voigt, one of our case managers, so to important. talk about that personal impact, how this affects an individual who's looking for housing, an individual who's trying to stay in housing and uh, because of these disruptions. Um, because it is all about the people who are impacted. Right. Uh, thank you, you so much, heart. Mike. I uh, appreciate your insights. Appreciate the work that you're doing at Tenfold. Your team over there is doing fantastic work to help our community. Thanks, John. Um, and I just it's loved mutual. having you here today. Yeah, so it's been a lot of fun and for grateful us. for everything you're doing as well. Thanks. So stick around. We'll be back with Wilsa Voigt uh, to talk a little bit more about this topic. I want to give a profound thanks to our season one podcast sponsor, Rogers & Associates, who's helping us tremendously in this first year of the Restores podcast. They're a wealth management firm that helps clients become financially independent for retirement. You can learn more about them online at rogers-associates.com or by calling 717-560-3800. That's rogers, R-O-D-G-E-R-S-associates.com or by calling 717-560-3800. Thank you so much, Rogers & Associates. Welcome back uh, for the second part of our podcast today, where we're talking about sustainable housing and homelessness. Uh, the last several um, podcasts, we've been talking about many of the elements of our whole person model as we think of walking alongside our guests and trying to help them move out of homelessness uh, we're addressing multiple different areas in their life. And obviously, you think about homelessness, you think about a lack of housing. And um, that is a reality that so many of our guests face, as we talked with Mike earlier and heard so many of the challenges that face our community right now. Um, I'm excited now to have a chance to talk with Wilsa Voigt, uh, who is one of our case managers here at Water Street. And um, Wilsa, you've been with us five years, right? Yeah, thank role. you for having me, and it's been <laughs> five years, yes. Yeah, and, uh, and we really appreciate you in the role of case manager, but you also spent a number of years volunteering with Water Street. Tell us just a little bit about that. I did. Uh, in 2007, I joined the health services where I was working assistant doctors, and when we came to the technology part, when everything went into the health service, um, the electronic knowledge, records, the electronic, yeah. and then I'm just like, that's it, this is it, <laughs> so they didn't need me as much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we're glad to have you over as a full-time case manager working with us and walking with our guests. Um, I know you've had a huge impact in the lives of many of our guests, um, so thank you, and, and so we're going to be talking with Wilsa about kind of the more uh, personal side, the individual side. We talked about the big picture with Mike. Um, but how do these challenges impact our guests? So, um, you know, the fact that there is such a dearth of affordable housing in Lancaster City, in Lancaster County, just in a general sense, Wilsa, how, does, how do you see that impact our guests on a day-to-day -day basis? It, it does, because when you work with the guests, you know, they come to us, they're broken. You help address that brokenness. You help address all the issue that led to homelessness. But now your goal, after a year, a year and a half, you want to, them to have housing. This is where the struggles begin. So you find yourself unable, you know, either they don't have income, they don't have enough income, or they cannot find a place. And the, one of the barriers that our guests find is that uh, the landlords is just like, no, you're from Water Street. You're from the shelter. We will not offer you a place to stay. Wow. There so is that, a lot of resistance. Wow. So that, I mean, that's a whole other dynamic we didn't even touch on with Mike. Mm -hmm. Regard, like, there's the, the income levels that are needed to get the housing. There's the fact that the market is just going higher and higher and higher. But then there can even be built-in prejudice against somebody who's yes. coming out of homelessness. For a moment, let's think about it from the landlord's perspective. Why would a landlord do that other than I'm just mean and evil and <laughs> I don't want to help somebody who's hurt? But practically, why would a landlord? Practically is the fact that they had maybe a bad experience with a previous guest. They didn't pay their rent. Uh, we had cases where the person would be in the place and leave after two weeks, mm -hmm. not pay enough. So they are very reticent, very hesitant to, oh, you come from the shelter. 
So they are very reticent. I think it's important. We don't, we can't demonize those who are trying to provide housing as landlords. There are some who are unscrupulous. Um, that exists. There are yes. slumlords in Lancaster. That is beyond denial. Um, but even those who are just trying to make a living through it, trying to help their community, there are challenges. And when you've had bad experiences, sometimes it's hard to take a chance. And But that impacts somebody who is yes. not even involved yes. in it, right? Um, so... Yeah, that, that's a, a really interesting insight that adds another layer of challenge for our guests. Um, thinking about just from a practical standpoint, you mentioned how many of our guests were walking with them, were trying to help address issues, helping them find uh, employment mm -hmm. at the right point in their journey. And then how easy is it to find a job that pays enough to afford an apartment in Lancaster? That, that's where our guests, when we do the budget, when we work with them and they cannot, at $15 an hour, our guests don't have the means to right. get an apartment when we consider the price of an apartment. Right. And the apartments, let's say at 845, if an apartment is at that, by the time our guests submit the application, somebody was there already. Mm -hmm. So you start to, to zero with yeah. that. Yeah, and with the low number of affordable housing, what have you run into? Because I know you walk this journey with them as a case manager, helping them contact and reach out, fill out applications, waiting lists. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Tell the, me a little bit about waiting list. Um, I just spoke to one today, yesterday, and they are doing April. He submitted his application in November. Wow. So, so you know, and some lists, some waiting lists are two, three years. And I noticed on a website, I was on, you know, one of our friends, one of the affordable housing developers who do great work in our community, and uh, all of their Lancaster family apartment complexes, their waiting lists are actually locked right now. They won't even take. Um, I know some of our guests in the past have been able to get Section 8 vouchers. That's another great. Can you first explain what is a Section 8 voucher and how does that help people in our guest situation? The Section 8 voucher, what it does, it covers the rent for the guest, they have to apply for it. But currently, there is no Section 8 voucher available. Right. And there is a, you have 60 days to find a place. So once you have a voucher, yes, you, you have, have 60, 60 days. days. And not everybody accepts Section 8 vouchers. Not everybody accepts. They give you the list of the landlord that will accept the Section 8 voucher, but sometimes they cannot, it's too busy, or they don't have uh, right. availability right. at the time so right. that's cause and section eight doesn't it's not free rent it doesn't cover a hundred percent but it because if you're making money you're you still to you're gonna pay mm -hmm. how much do you pay if if i was to get a section eight voucher i'm a single guy working a warehouse job and i'm, I'm moving into that apartment and somehow i was lucky enough to get a section eight voucher that would be like one third yeah one so third. so i would pay one third of my income mm -hmm. and then the section eight voucher covers the difference yes and then, the, so the landlord's getting their full rent. Oh, um, yes, they, as, do. Yeah. they do. Great. But again, the challenge of getting it and the fact that, no. so right now there's none There is no available. whatsoever. The last one, we just gave it to somebody. They yeah. just gave it to someone. Okay. Sure. And are they, do they have a waiting list for that as well? There is. I put some people on that list <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> two years. Yes. It's, man. It, they are number 51 and 58. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even when they reopen it, they're yeah, 5158. Yes. And yeah. circumstances may have changed dramatically in that time uh, by the time they get that call. Yes. Um, so and I, I hadn't thought about that challenge before. So the vouchers only in only available to you for 60 days. For 60 days. Um, yes. And but you can ask for an extension. Okay. If you show that you're looking for it, they can give yeah. you a 30 days extension and, it, and another 30 days extension. That's yeah. it. If not, you lose it. So I, I get a lot of questions from people about, you know, kind of the big picture, you know, people who come to Water Street, how long do they normally stay there? How, how long are they normally with you? And I tell them there's no normal uh, answer to that no. question because everybody's journey is unique, which is one of the things hopefully we've been emphasizing through this podcast and people are beginning to understand. But um, one of the big factors that can affect that is we will have guests who will walk through that journey, do their program show a lot of growth and change, get a job, and then they're still here for a while. Um, and from the outside looking in, it's like, that makes no sense to me. Why is that person still with you? But hearing some of these challenges, it makes sense. 
you know, can you share a story, maybe think of an individual who, who had that challenge where it was a really extended challenge of like, hey, in every other sense of their life, they're kind of at that point. It's time to move out, but they just can't find it. I have one, actually. He's been there for a while, um, you know, trying to get all this stuff in, in line. Right. He finally has it, but he cannot find housing. Mm. And also there's that sense of security that he has staying at the mission. He gets the support. People love on him. Yeah. But I said, no, time to get out of here. Yeah. But where? So, the, so there's the, the practical challenges and the emotional challenges mm -hmm. of taking that step out. And, and I think that's another thing we underestimate sometimes because sustainable housing isn't just about the financial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it has to be in an affordable range, um, you know, where you can – you can make enough money to pay your rent and utilities and all those other factors and not be on the brink of, of losing your apartment every week. That can be a financial issue. What are the other issues from a personal standpoint that like when somebody moves out into that apartment are critical for them to have for that to be sustainable? The support. We don't want them to lose the support they had here mm. that made them successful to the point where they could get housing. We need to go out there and continue yeah. to support them. Okay, that's something that's key. Yeah, and on campus, that support can come from the life coaches, case managers, the the resident next door in their mm -hmm. in the dorm room next door. Um, what does that look like in the community, though? Because the life coaches and case managers aren't going to be bumping into you in the hallway no, every they, day, every other not. day. They're not. So and how does uh, what? does that look like for a guest to develop that but support? Yes, we will, you know, we had a couple of guests that are getting that support one-on-one. Mm. -on -one. We They will call us, you know, do I need that help. I need to, my apartment is too small. I need to move out. Uh, can you help me? Mm. So we, we, the life coach, the case manager, we, yeah. uh, we're going to help you yeah. with this. But uh, it's mostly guidance. Guidance. guidance yeah and even like knowing how to take care of my own home if i've been on the street in shelters in a residential program for many months even mm -hmm. multiple years sometimes um kind of rebuilding those skills right that they miss i just had one she moved to her apartment after she's been here for a while she moved with her son and she just miss wilson that's the first time i don't know how to cook <laughs> I'm just, okay, I'll buy you a, a crock pot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but that's what I did. Right, so she right, has right. a crock pot, but she just, so it, she's learning. She has to learn yeah. the, those stuff that she lost for the time she was in right, shelter. Right. Yep. Doing laundry. Mm -hmm. The laundry, they do it upstairs. Yeah. They do so it they, the rest. Yeah. But it's me. It's yeah. me and me. Yeah. We're not there to, to right. support. Nobody's there to remind you. Mm -mm. Nobody's there to help you yeah. answer questions. So, it, yeah, that challenge is huge. Um, taking a step back from, you know, helping people move out into housing, you know, homelessness, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, well, why is somebody homeless? It's because they don't have a home. It's because they don't have a house. Housing must be the issue. And we know uh, from our conversation so far and with Mike, affordable housing is a major issue. It obviously is contributing to the, the growth of homelessness in our community, but how often do we see home like a lack of an affordable house, a lack of um, or or even being evicted being the primary reason for somebody coming to Water Street, ending up literally on the streets or in a shelter? Personally, I can have I have two examples. Uh, it was a couple. They were sitting. They were living in the basement with a family, okay. and they couldn't afford it. Mom got pregnant. She, with the second child, it didn't go well. So she lost her job and could not afford to pay. Mm -hmm. So she ended up, the family asked her to leave. So she ended up with us. Yeah. With a, and she wasn't, baby. she couldn't find another apartment she no, could afford no, she, if she couldn't even afford a room. No, she yeah. couldn't. She couldn't. She was in a basement. So the family, that whole family, the father had to separate and the mom had to stay with us. I mean, do we, and, and that's a good example. And it sounds like even that one isn't, it's interlay, interlocking issues, right? Mm -hmm. It was a health thing. It was a loss of job. Then that led to loss of housing yes. um, and lack of ability to afford something else. Um, you know, can you think of anywhere literally it was like, hey, we just could, couldn't afford our rent. We couldn't find a place. 
And so now we're turning to Water Street. Like, I have a job, I but I just can't find an affordable place, and I've, I'm coming to Water Street for this a, season. A lot of the guests, the, not a lot, but there are some of the guests who just need a place to stay. Yeah. They, they are working, but they don't make enough to get housing. So they come to us. Yeah. And we'll often work with some of those guests who do have some stability in other areas of their life and they just can't find it. Often those are the guests who will stay in our Providence shelter. Mm -hmm. Yes, They won't necessarily go into residential because we'll focus on how do we help them find that affordable place, um, and hopefully within a reasonable window of time, right? Yeah, yeah. but you know how hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and as we said, so that wouldn't necessarily be the majority of people who are coming in the no, door, though. No, because some of the guests, they had housing, but because of their behavior or other struggles, they are unable to keep that housing. So they come to us. So it wasn't the affordability of it. Mm -mm. It was other factors. Other factors, yeah. yes. And, and that's some of what we're addressing in our other podcasts, too. You know, how we're looking at different issues and root issues in people's lives and trying to walk with them. So <laughs> this whole topic, admittedly, can be a little depressing. Oh, um, the challenges, um, banging your head against the wall, looking for something that's affordable. You've got somebody who's been working and, and really struggling to get to a better place and they just can't find anything in their price range, um, that can be depressing. I'd love if you could share maybe a positive story, a, a victory that we've I seen. I do, I do have one. I know we have them, thank you. I, uh, no, no, <laughs> I, I do. But I tend to tell to the guests that, you know what, Water Street is just a pit stop. I said, you know, I have a picture in their action plan, it's a pit stop. You come, you fix yourself, you're out. But in order for, for I had that guess. He is. He came to. He was a rebounding guess, mm -hmm. coming over and over and over. We created special AP for him. Just he could teach the classes. <laughs> he knew because he knew his struggle. Yeah. But finally, he called me. Said, "You know, I'm ready." He got a job, a good paying job, and God has blessed him with an apartment not too far from here, yeah. in the ranch he could afford. I'm just, how did you get that? Shh, I'm not telling you. <laughs> but he's not sharing it, but he was able to get because he didn't want to get a room. Yeah. So he ended up going that place. So that's his place. He said yeah. it's not big, but he's happy with it. It's a small apartment, but he's yep. happy with it. And that's, that's the key. Like, it's not necessarily about, you know, all the space in the world, but it is challenging. Sometimes the only affordable places are kind of scary. Like, we've seen that, right? Oh, they, um, they, 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 yeah. You know, in a market like this, you know, single room occupancies where you've got a bathroom down the hall and a mini kitchenette in your room in a single room, you know, those are going for six, seven hundred dollars. Yes. And um, so it's wonderful to hear a story of, that, of that, finding yeah, that right place, one, even somebody yes. who's rebounded and had that struggle. Um, Curious, would are there any families um, that you've been able to walk with that have seen a victory in the housing community? She just uh, left, and that person was in the program, the Isaiah 61. Oh, really? That that young lady, she came, she had a son, but she struggled. She struggled. We, oh, my word, that's, that's a kid. It's like she's 16. We had to push her. Oh, wow. And then she graduated. She, she graduated as a vet tech. Oh, wow. So she had a diploma. Excellent. We connected her with Bridge of Hope, mm -hmm. and they helped her get a place to stay. Excellent. That was the way for her to get the place That's to stay. awesome. And that's a great reminder that it's not just about Water Street. It's not just about Wilsa, the case manager, nah. trying to find the right place. There are partners in the community you that we can to. work with. And um, we were speaking earlier with Mike McKenna from Tenfold. We know that they have you know sheltered independent living and other resources, and we often connect with them. You mentioned Bridge of Hope. Yes, they, they, they do help us. That That's actually most of the success stories I have is because we connected through the community. We had Bridge of Hopes, Homes of Hope, all the hopes, all the hopes. <laughs> all the hopes. So, <laughs> so we, we connected with them. Yeah. So that's, able, you know, we're able, can you support that person? Can you help us? Yeah. We did our part. Can you? So community, the community support is, is key. That's wonderful to hear. And that, and that really reflects... One of the core values of Water Street, right? Partnership with the community. No. We can't do this alone. Our guests can't do it alone. We work together. Uh, we walk with them, but we also walk with other organizations in the community. We're grateful for them. Wilsa, well, so thank you for taking the time to, to share with us um, the challenges and even the joys of walking through this real challenge of sustainable housing.
Yeah. And I hope you enjoyed our conversation today. Um, it's a real challenge. Um, you know, there's, it's, I think we're all well, well aware of that reality and the challenges in front of us. Um, continue to, to lift up Water Street and our partners in the community as we uh, walk with our guests in this challenging season um, and try to help them find sustainable housing. Thanks for joining us today.